Happy Halloween, Chicago. Welcome to another episode of Phantology. Today we're going to be reviewing Deadbeat, Dresden Files number 7 by Jim Butcher. And Ben is on to review with me. What's up, Ben? How's it going, Steven? Okay, so this book, this Dresden Files book, I haven't reviewed enough of the other ones, the more recent ones, to say if it's my favorite. But this is a really memorable one for me. Like, I think I've been telling you for a while, like, keep on reading Dresden Files. They're going to get good. This is the point, I think, in doing this review, getting ready for this review, where I think it really turns the corner. And if you don't like this Dresden Files book, at this point, give up. Because (laughs) this is where it really gets good. This is where it really engaged me and and all the plot lines kind of starting together. So what do you kind of think of the book? No spoilers yet, but high level. Like, were you as high on this as I was? Yeah, honestly, I think I love this book. I think for me, it started last book, whereas like if you didn't like last book, which I know a lot of people didn't um, because of all the connotations around last book. But but for me, that was when I was like, okay, this is picking up. This is starting to really get good. It's kind of starting to integrate all the different plot lines pretty seamlessly and you see a glimpse of most people in every book and they kind of affect certain things and so um i thought that this book just kind of took that to the whole next level and, and was really good yeah i'm pretty sure every single different faction in the chicago verse made an appearance in this book and in reviewing it myself there's a lot of hints dropped things that are going to be more important so i thought yeah jim butcher does a really good job he kind of knows where he, he wants to go with this series at this point and everything's kind of starting to, to come together and in addition there's a lot of really fun things that happen in this book including my number one favorite dresden file scene which we'll get to coming up but i'm sure you know what i'm talking about having just read oh yeah oh yeah i think i kind of when you you, dr- you dropped a reference to it at the end of the last podcast and I knew as soon as, as soon as a certain event happened, I'm like, okay, this is what Steve was talking about. Yeah, I mean, if you want to listen to a book for pure entertainment value, the ending of Deadbeat is fantastic. And just you, you just have this stupid sloppy grin on your face, I think, the whole time that you're listening to the final climax, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. It was one of those moments where you're like, I just want to see this portrayed in some way on the big screen. Just give it to me, you know? Yeah, can we please get a Dresden Files TV show reboot? I know they did one on sci-fi that didn't really go anywhere. I think it was just one season and it didn't really follow the book super well. It was kind of a flop. I mean, I watched a couple episodes of that before starting the book books and I, di- I didn't hate it. But then after I read the books, I'm like, wow, that could have been so much better. Maybe one day we're getting adaptations for a lot of stuff. So who knows? Maybe Dresden is there. But for now, we're content reading the books and looking forward to the two new books coming later this year. So before we go too far into actual spoilers, quick plug for Phantology. If you like what we're putting out, check us out at Phantology Books and at www.phantology.com where we have all of our links and episodes uh, posted up there. And if you like what we're doing, check us out on Patreon where we put some exclusive content. Uh, we, we try to do some like raw reactions as soon as we finish a book. So you really get to see what we thought right away And I also go back and put corrections for all the mistakes that we make during these podcasts because we don't claim to be experts on any of these series, just fans. So we're going to make mistakes, but I try to keep us honest. And if you really like what we're doing and would like to chat with us or anyone else in our community, check us out on Discord. We have a growing community and we would really like to get more Dresden Files fans. So if you're a fan of the series and want to chat us up and are excited for the new books coming out, please hop on there and let us know what you think about Dresden. Yep. And um, we also just wanted to plug two more things. We did a fun Twitter poll um, this month that had to do with your top five favorite series. Shout out to the Wheel Weaves podcast for taking home the big W on that competition. Um, of course, Wheel of Time was their top book book series. And so that was awesome. Had a lot of really good engagement. And I think for um, for this month, for the month of June, we are going to be doing a top characters list so get ready for that yeah we're gonna kick that kick that off with an episode with hopefully all of phantology going through our top three evil villain characters we are going to avoid spoilers so any character that's like a dramatic reveal of them being an evil villain not eligible please do not do spoilers yeah so we can't choose like voldemort as a as a villain or no voldemort's obviously a villain that's not a we know he's a villain from the beginning (laughs) And I think giving any examples would be a spoiler, so I'm not going to do that. But you kind of know, like, if there's a character 
who you're not sure about at the beginning of the book and it goes through and they're maybe like appear to be good. And then at the end, there's a big reveal where they're the villain. Yeah, that's not someone that we'd want on our character list. That's an obvious uh, spoiler. So more traditional evil villains, but give us your top three and we'll be asking for submissions and we'll do another Twitter style poll and have a winner by the end of the month. And we are actually going to be doing um, our first kind of big Patreon benefit during that podcast. And so if you're a Patreon member, we can you can hop on the Discord for that and do a live voice recording of that. So I think when you're listening to this, this will probably have already taken place. But for next month, um, for our July podcast, if you want to get on that, then you can support us on Patreon. Yeah, one of our Patreon tiers. Check us out on Patreon for, for what those different tier benefits are. But enough about Phantology. Let's talk some Dresden Files. Deadbeat. So we're going to get into spoilers. I guess before we quite do that, we'll do our quick content warning. Although if you've listened to Dresden Files episodes before or read the books, you probably know what to expect. Dresden Files is kind of TV 14-ish, uh, pretty solid PG-13 type rating where there is some language, some sexual content, really not much in this book, although there's a little bit with Thomas since he's a white court vampire. And there's certainly some violence, some some magical violence, but also um, a lot of you know human type violence as well. There there are there's definitely some blood shed, but nothing too gruesome, I would say. Yeah, and I would say this book actually probably dials it back a little bit. There wasn't really any, not even super strong language in this one. That's probably also why it had kind of like a more whimsical feel to it. I think is because it wasn't ever like in your face kind of bloody violence like the first couple of books were okay so you kind of felt this one was a little more fun yep i would say that's the case and maybe we can kind of revisit that when we're doing spoilers but i think some of the magical like types that were being used in this book were just kind of had like a less serious feel to it than other books yeah, I would say this book is definitely a fun romp through Chicago. I mean, I would say the entire series as a whole is that's what it is, although there are some heavier moments. But this book, yeah, we're just romping through Chicago. And that's a good word, a good description uh, word to use if you know what some of the plot elements are. And let's go into spoilers now. So if you haven't read the book, don't want things spoilers, spoiled, now would be the time to hop off. So the book starts, this is a year after the events of blood rights. And we see that with Thomas having kind of established himself as Harry's roommate and Harry's about ready to kill him because roommates can sometimes drive you crazy a little bit, especially if it's your brother, your half brother. And mouse is much larger. Now he's like up to Harry's waist. And that was foreshadowed at the end of blood rights. Uh, mouse is now kind of coming into his own, although he's still kind of like a gangly teenage dog, but he's, he definitely has his moments and he will have more going forward. Uh, Thomas is have, having a rough time kind of establishing himself, having been kicked out of the white court, can't hold down a job. He's turning the apartment inside out and he's not a very good roommate. And Murphy has established a bit of a relationship with Kincaid and she takes off to Hawaii with him and Harry is jealous. So we really start to like get these established feelings that Harry um, it ha- maybe has some feelings for Murphy, but he's blocked by Kincaid and Murphy is absent for the majority of this book, but the plot really revolves around Murphy because Harry's trying to protect her. So Ben, as you kind of jumped into the intro to this book, things have changed a bit since Blood Rights. What do you think of some of these changes? I enjoyed them. I thought it was funny that Thomas couldn't hold down a job because he kept on like having women throw themselves at him. And so that was just kind of humorous. And he wasn't a good roommate because he was kind of progressively getting worse and worse with like withdrawal from like spiritual energy, you know, which you kind of get a good sense for <clears throat> later on in the book. He uses an analogy that like he races Harry on the beach and they go to drink some water and like he only lets Harry like take like a little sip of it. And then he's like, imagine doing this for a year. And so we kind of get a sense that that Thomas is really struggling with and he's trying to do the right thing and be a moral person and and not take advantage of people and not beat off of people but that's really taking a toll on him. So I thought that was interesting. Like it goes from just being like a sloppy roommate to like, man, this guy's really struggling, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's some good moments later on where Harry really opens up with Thomas and they have a heart to heart and that conversation happens. And I think this is one of the theme of Dresden Files, like trying to do the right thing, despite the odds stacked up against you. 
And sometimes those things are so insurmountable that what can you do but kind of draw upon something that you previously never would have done, um, such as what you see Harry do later with the Denarian, right? So, so because of circumstances that are out of your control, the only way to do the right thing is to kind of do the wrong thing a little bit and walk that fine line. And that's what Dresden really does a good job of delivering on. There are some, uh, some, some deeper messages buried in the Pulp Fiction. Yeah, so I like that. In terms of Lieutenant Karen Murphy going off with Kin- Kincaid, I have kind of mixed feelings about that. Like to go from being a stalwart police officer who like won't do anything wrong to like dating a, a killer for hire. That's like a pretty dramatic character sh- shift. And I don't know if it was earned for her yet. And so I don't know. That was kind of a little bit of a letdown for me. It was fun to see her kind of give Harry the opportunity to tell her to not go by kind of go- coming over and offering to like telling him to water her pants and like, kind of hinting like, hey, just say the word and I won't go. So it's clear that she's kind of interested in him as well. It's kind of like a will they, won't they thing. So that's fun. Right, yeah. I actually wasn't sure if she was doing that or not. I mean, that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is she is maybe not really caring what Harry's feelings are and and she just is there. But yeah, watering the plants, that's kind of a lame excuse. So, so maybe you're right. To me, it's more like Butcher needed a way to drag the will they, won't they thing along and this is kind of the way they chose was to have have murphy kind of go off gallivanting with with him i also think that you hinted that the plot revolves around her i think that this is a way to have the plot revolve around her without her sucking up a lot of the oxygen of the book yeah because there probably wasn't even space for another character in this plot because there's a lot going on right yeah and a lot of it has to do with with harry kind of developing an interest in another woman so that that takes up a lot of the plot. And would that have happened if Murphy was still there? Probably not. So I feel like this is a way for, for Butcher to have Murphy leave while still maintaining a presence and have, have Harry kind of be, do the Harry thing, which is fall for anything with, with legs. Right. And Harry agrees to go on this date with Sheila. That happens later on, right after she he gets a voicemail from Murphy with like Kincaid in the background and he's jealous and and right, so maybe that wouldn't have happened if Murphy was there. And if she was there, it would have been a bigger plot thing that maybe wouldn't have fit into the book. So yeah, I, I like that explanation of uh, Butcher needing to kind of remove Murphy, but still make her the focus of a lot of it. And super funny with the voicemail, it all had to do with pants. She had like a 40 inch slip where she said pants instead of plants. So that was pretty funny. And it kind of showed a level of self-awareness that he had from the last book where people were kind of complaining about Kincaid taking off her pants. And he kind of, I feel like tried to reconcile that and, and tried to kind of harken back to it a little bit in this book with that. So that was fun. I actually enjoyed that part. Yeah. I might need to go back and see if there's any interviews with him, like responding to the pants scene from the previous book. Cause the whole fandom is just united against this scene. Yeah. It's easy to see why it just kind of came out of nowhere, but we talked about that last episode. Yeah. So the plot that we referenced, the revolution around Murphy is the fact that Mavra is back, right? So we thought we killed her in the previous book, but that didn't happen. She was, I guess, kind of projecting a different uh, ghoul or, va- or uh, vampire that was actually killed. And so she's still alive and she is blackmailing Dresden with photos of Murphy, incriminating photos that she's ready to send to the police because Murphy is killing what looks like a human, but is really like a possessed i think renfield like a a vampire uh, goon i guess is the best way to describe them so if she was to send in these photos murphy's career and life would be ruined and what she wants from dresden is the word of kemler we don't know what this is yet but it sounds ominous they have this meeting over harry's grave at the uh big chicago cemetery what's the name of the cemetery um it's it's that cemetery uh graceland right Sounds right. And it was funny because yeah. when I was listening out, I was like, well, this has got to be a stop on our Chicago tour. So mark yeah, that down. Yeah, the, the Chicago tour of Dresden that Phantology is putting together. I did see in the comments on a, a tour page about Dresden that Butcher actually kind of butchers the actual locations of these Chicago places. Like they're actually spaced out further along than he makes them. And it doesn't really make sense that they're able to travel from place to place. But I mean, come on, that can't be too much of a criticism because you can't, if you're building a book that revolves around locations in Chicago, it's like way too much to ask for the actual minutes of travel between place to place to line up. 
Yeah, that's kind of like you got to be have something up your butt to to complain about that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't I don't mind that. I do think that he like if he would have chosen a city that he like lived in or something, he could have probably done it without too much effort. But to complain about it is just kind of ridiculous. Did he did he not live there? I actually don't know. I, I don't know either. I'm assuming if he would have lived there, then then he probably wouldn't have made those mistakes. I assume that he knew that it wasn't exactly. Yeah, he's just saying like, this is my interpretation of Chicago and it yeah. needs to work for plot reasons. Like it's urban fantasy. It's OK to make mistakes. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And to go back to our tour of Chicago, I've actually been like thinking a lot about this. I think that we need to get a school bus, but but paint it like a Volkswagen bug. Okay. So the Blue Beetle expanded version. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so that's going to be what the what the fine dress and files fans are getting, the type of high quality content that they're getting when they go on this tour. Every time we talk about this, it reminds me of that Seinfeld episode where Kramer is doing a tour of New York in a bus. I think it's one of the later Seinfeld episodes. Do you remember that one? I do not. Yeah, that, that one's beautiful. And Kramer is like describing the locations in these total Kramer ways. I think we can offer a higher quality tour of Chicago, though, right? I mean, we're for sure going to try, at least. This might this tour might only happen like once every year because we have to like gather up all the Dresden fans for it. But it's going to happen. Yeah, we'll have to make this a severe Patreon stretch goal or start a <laughs> Kickstarter or something. <laughs> sure. Okay, so the word of Kemmler is this ominous thing, and Harry, of course, goes to Bob to figure out what's going on here, and Bob knows stuff, because he used to be owned by this dude, Kemmler, who is seriously evil, started World War I, apparently had a long history of a, of a long fight with the wardens of the White Council and was eventually killed, and Bob was passed on from him. And Harry unlocks Bob's memories that he had suppressed, and then Bob himself becomes seriously evil to the point where he's like about to, to kill Harry. And Harry ends the conversation in time. So you called for an expansion of Bob in the previous book. You're getting it here because Bob has a moment later on. That's really fun as well. So this is cool, right? Like we can see some more things with Bob going on. Oh, yeah. This was done perfectly. I think that, I mean, it's all I ever wanted from Bob to do was to just like bust out and suddenly be like this force to be reckoned with. And I thought it was done in a way that made a lot of sense. Um, it didn't seem forced at all. So I was a fan of that. This is like Age of Ultron, right? Avengers Age of Ultron. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with that. Very similar. The AI gets this like additional self-awareness and then causes problems down the line. I mean, a little different plot lines. And this came out first, I think. Oh, yeah. This is what, like 2006? Uh, I'm going to guess 2008, but I don't have Wikipedia on hand. So it's book seven, and I know he pumped him out really fast at the beginning. I'm standing by 2008. 2005. Whoa, okay. I underestimated Butcher. Yeah. So going on from uh, the part with Bob, Harry goes to visit Butters, his buddy, his mortician buddy, because he knows it has to do with necromancy. And Butters has formed like this one-man polka band thing. This is uh, kind of funny and introduces Butters as a character that's going to be more important. And then we get a zombie attack from one of three Kemlerites that are going to kind of drive the plot along. Three different necromancers that are disciples of Kemler, we'll say, that are all looking for this word, looking to gain power. And we're able to uh, suppress this zombie attack. And we go looking now for a book about the Earl King, who is this fae uh, king, king of the goblins. And Harry goes to look for it at this rare bookstore. And Sheila gets introduced. And she is a, as far as we know, this attractive bookstore worker that uh, Harry makes a connection with. And right as he goes to get this book, he gets another attack from Cowl who is another one of these Kemlerite disciples. And that attack is also, you know, Harry also kind of escapes from that attack. He doesn't, he's not able to take down either Gervain or Gravain or Cowl. And this time he gets help from Billy and Georgia and the Alphas, our werewolf friends. And he kind of opens up to them a little bit. He opens up to Butters and Thomas, fills them in with what's going on, talks about some personal issues. And there are some concerns about Harry that his friends are voicing. So I thought these were kind of some some nice moments as we really get to see Harry value his friends and bring them in. Previously, he's been kind of a closed off, typical macho man dude, but he's starting to realize that he really needs to bring people into his life. 
a few thoughts while you're yeah. you're explaining that. One thing I thought was lacking, I couldn't really keep track of the difference between Cowl and oh, what's the other guy's name? Cowl, Gervain, and Corpse Taker are yeah. the three main. Corpse Taker was distinct mainly because she was a girl. So I could, and she kind of had different motivation than Cal and Gravain. But to me, Cal and Gravain just kind of felt like interchangeable. I could, I didn't really keep track of those guys when I was reading. Did you have the same impression? Or I guess that's definitely fair. I mean, you have these three different villains that are all pretty similar and do similar types of magic. Like that's a total fair criticism. I'm with you there. There is kind of a mystery as to who Cowl is because there's some hints that there's some kind of like traitor in the White Council of Wizards and Cowl is one of them or is involved in something that's going on. So that's an open mystery with Dresden fans. Who is Cowl? Yeah, so I was kind of hoping that like the, because it was strongly hinted that there would be, that there's a traitor in the White Court. And so I was hoping that that would kind of reveal itself in this this book. But then it just didn't really turn out to be a big deal at all. Not yet, but it's definitely set up for more White Council actions going forward. Sure. So now we go to, and Harry's kind of going on all of his different stops in Chicago, right? These will be part of the tour. So we go to the Field Museum, where there are some more corpses. There is a corpse from a Marcone guy. So Marcone is involved as well. And this guy has a flash drive embedded in him. We get the flash drive. Harry obviously can't use it because he's a wizard and he'll make everything go bad. But on the flash drive are 16 numbers. That's all we know so far. So that's a mystery. Sheila, we interact with her again, and she asks Harry out, which she accepts, because he's jealous about Murphy. And then there's a fight with Corpse Taker, so our third of the three Kemalarite disciples is introduced. Uh, Corpse Taker, like you said, is distinct. She can do some more mental magic, and her little assistant hits Harry with a throwing star. It looks bad for Harry. He can't really take out any of these guys. He's saved by Marcone and a helicopter, and Marcone's Mark Hone's backup. I don't remember her name right now, but she's going to become um, more of a character as well. So now that we have all three and we've got Mark Hone introduced and we've got the Fae introduced and the White Council, I guess, hasn't come in yet, but things are really kind of starting to uh, line up here for an exciting conclusion, or at least the action's really building up. Ben, did you kind of feel the tension mounting here? Yeah, I did. One thing I thought was interesting was that Marcone saved Harry. Whoever he was with said that Harry was destined to die there or something like that. And um, that they shouldn't have intervened because that was his destiny, which I thought was kind of crazy. Like, first of all, who like the hints that there's some like greater destiny thing going on there. Also, it seems like it would have been kind of like an ignominious death for Harry to die like that. And then it's just, I don't know, it, the whole thing kind of seemed weird. So I, I didn't really know what to make of that. In terms of Marcone's intervention? Yeah, well, I mean, I could see Marcone intervening, but like, why was it hinted that he was destined to die? A character said that. It was kind of weird that it kind of came out of nowhere. I actually don't remember that. I know later on, when he takes down Quintus Cassius, the former Denarian, that character puts a death spell, death curse on him, where he says, die alone. So I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about or not. I do also remember that Marcone's backup bodyguard is named a guard right so she's going to be a character in future books as well but i don't remember what you're talking about yeah i guess maybe i'll go i'll ask people on discord or something and look up the exact line of it but it was it was for sure interesting also it was cool that we kind of got marcone i i like that he kind of peeks his head in every once in a while and and helps him out yeah they have a really great frenemy relationship for sure and i like the death theme throughout the book so uh he he stands off with mavra in front of his grave he gets this death curse placed upon him it's all about necromancy so death is a strong theme and he talks about death quite a bit it's, it's an interesting theme like i mean death is part of the human condition and it's something that's fun to explore yeah i thought it was interesting um he talked about like the fact that you realize that you can die when you're super young and then you forget about it for like 20 years and then you re-remember it I thought that was like, it was one of those rare insightful things that, that authors kind of talk about. So action goes on and we find out more about the Earl King. So the Earl King as part of the Wild Hunt, which is something that I think this comes from like Celtic mythology, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's something that's in the Witcher books as well, I know. 
And so during this wild hunt, the Earl King would call up shades of former warriors. And this is a inopportune time to do this because the Kemlarites would gobble them up as necromancers and become like minor gods. So that's what's at stake here. And Harry's got to stop this from happening. He gets this information from the Fae and he tries to call up his godmother, Leah, but instead Queen Mab appears. And Leah, I guess, has been sidelined. We don't really know what's going on there, but that is a bit of a tidbit that's you might want to document away for future books. And she also gives Harry an offer to become the Winter Knight, which he turns down yet again. And remember that I think he still owes Mab a couple favors from way back. But, and, and those are going to pop up as well. So we see some of the Fae come in as well. Nice to get that part uh, going into the books. Always fun to see them cross over. And then we have some more zombie fighting. Harry goes on a date with Sheila. And this is so weird to me. Imagine going on a date at this time with all of like the stakes that are mounting up here. You know that necromancers are literally trying to become gods. And you're like, oh, yeah, sure. Let's go on a date with this girl that I met at a bookstore. What in the world? Yeah, that was kind of weird. Do you remember where they went? No, I think there was like some talk of a Halloween party that she was going to. But I want to say it's like maybe just at her apartment or something. Like They, they don't go anywhere. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they just stayed at her apartment. And that makes sense for the reveal that, that comes up at the end. Yeah, because she can't really be seen with anyone else because she's not real. She's just a projection of Lashiel. But I mean, again, going on a date with all of Chicago at stake here just feels so strange. And yeah, it felt very forced. And I guess Harry is just so hardened and he's, he's so accustomed to saving the world. He's like, oh, OK, yeah, whatever. Yeah, he's got very strong uh, mental stamina here. I agree with that. It kind of seemed out of nowhere. Of course, I feel like when she asked him out, it wasn't the stakes weren't as high. So maybe that makes sense. But Harry's always on the lookout for some new girls to flirt with. Hey, he's a young guy. He's just trying to find love. Nothing wrong with that. This is before Tinder. So he's got to take his opportunities when they come. Seems like he would swipe right, swipe right on every single person then. <laughs> just swiping right on everyone and like taking every match he could possibly. Oh, yeah. So the wardens get called in because Harry realizes that the stakes are pretty high. Even though he's going on random dates, he does realize that the wardens need to come in and help him out here. And we learn that a lot of these wardens have died recently. And the war with the Red Court is not going super well. I think they said 20% of the Red Court or of the wardens got taken out in a recent attack. And Harry's promoted and he gets offered the job as like warden of Chicago. So finally, Harry's getting some recognition as the true savior of this city. He realizes that he needs to summon the Earl King and he's going to do this in a magic circle. And he's this is going to prevent the Kemlerites from summoning him. But unfortunately, it doesn't go well because right as he summons him and traps him away, Cowl comes and jumps him and Bob is taken. The Earl King is released and things are really not going well. And he also realizes that Sheila is Leshiel She's like a projection of the demon that inhabits part of Harry's mind. And we also realize that the GPS coordinates are leading them to back to the museum. So stakes are raised. Few revelations have happened. What do you think at this point, Ben? I mean, a lot happened really fast, right? So, you know, it showed that the wizards were like totally getting outflanked by the vampires. So like the war is not going well for the wizards at this point. And that, that was interesting because you can see that there's a bunch of stuff happening in the wizarding world that Harry is not a part of right now. And he's kind of trying to keep his head down and, and just protect people in Chicago. And so the fact that like now the war has kind of come to his doorstep, not like in the traditional sense, but like he's actually made a word. And, um, and so now he has some type of responsibility. And so he's kind of been sucked up into this conflict. And so I thought that, that it probably sets things up well going forward. I have a lot to say about the... The Lashiel uh, revelation that that she was not actually real in a, in a projection. I think we're almost there. Let's talk about that when he does like the meta thing with her. Okay, yeah. Like you were saying, it's kind of nice to see the expansion of the war because you get an idea that, okay, it's not all just happening for Harry in Chicago. I think it's a little unbelievable at times to think, oh my gosh, everyone is attacking Harry all the time in Chicago. Like there's a wide world out there. Why is it all happening in Chicago? And so getting tidbits like this, like, okay, there is really more going on outside of just Chicago. Yeah, I agree. And it also kind of tells you like why wizards just aren't at Harry's beck and call to like come and help him out. So, you know, they're like finishing a war that he started in this, you know? Yeah, Harry's got to do this because there's really no one else to help him out at this point. I do think, though, that like 
it's crazy that the the book of Kem- Kemler would like find its way to Chicago. You know, that's that's kind of interesting. Also, it seems like every wizard knows about these type of things besides Harry. <laughs> Whenever anybody said Kemler's name, all the other wizards were like, "Oh no, that's bad." And Harry just like had no no idea about it before. It seems like especially because his mentor's mentor that went bad was named Justin, right? Yeah, Justin was the person who raised him, right? Yeah, it seemed like, especially if he was involved in kind of like the dark arts that he would have tried to expose Harry to like, at least know who Kemmler was. So I thought it was kind of weird that Harry didn't know who that was. Roughly. I see what you're saying there. I think maybe it's a little believable because Harry's never really been part of the White Council and he doesn't have the typical education that I imagine a White Council wizard would have received. He's raised himself. He's very self-taught. Um, he's like a wilder from Wheel of Time, if you will. So he doesn't know these traditional things that a, a regular white court wizard would know. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. I, I could believe that. So the action continues. And like you said, the word of Kemmler is found on the T-Rex skull at the Field Museum. And of course, Harry is jumped again. And this time by, I think, Cowell. And Quintus Cassius is revealed to have been the backup it might not have been Cowell, actually. This might have been Gervain. I don't remember exactly. But the word of Kemmler is now out there. Harry, like, speed reads it, which I guess he thinks will be helpful. But I don't know if that's really believable to think that you could speed read an ancient tome like this and pitch up, pick up important magical abilities. It is does pay off for him, but kind of a desperate decision, maybe? He had already had Le Shield's help before that um, with remembering the incantation to summon the, oh, the Earl, the Earl King? Right. So the way that that had worked is he had like glanced through it and then Les Sheila had mentioned, or Sheila had mentioned that she had a photographic memory and then she was able to tell him exactly word for word the incantation. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for keeping me honest there. Yeah. So we're, yeah. Okay. That is a legitimate plot point. We're not going to be critical of that one. So Quintus Cassius, the snake boy, this is the Denarian that back in book five, Harry kind of tortured with a baseball bat to get information out of. And now we're repaying the favor because this guy cuts into Harry using a bat. He had previously beaten up the blue beetle with a bat. Luckily mouse comes in at a very opportune time with butters and I think kills him, right? Like Harry commands him to kill and he does. And so Quintus Cassius is taken down, but not before uttering his death rattle, death rattle, right? From uh, stormlight. If you know those books, but uh, he curses Harry to die alone and sounds ominous. We don't know what that's going to mean yet, but he also then at this point blacks out and has this meta moment with Lashiel where Harry decides to free partly if she agrees to help him with the necromancy with you, which he realizes he's going to need to save innocence at this point. So kind of like I was saying, Harry has resisted this for the better part of at least a year, maybe longer But at this point, he's like, I got to do the right thing. And the right thing at this point means more self-sacrifice. So I'm going to give in to a literal fallen angel. Interesting. Yeah. And he had kind of gone down the slippery slope earlier when he had consciously used Hellfire to defeat one of the, I think it was Cowl in in this fight. Actually, I think that's against Corpse Taker where he uses that. Yeah. 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 So he had kind of started down and it was kind of hinted that he was going to be going down that path. Because he found out it was Hellfire, I think at the end of the last book, Bob had yep. been like, Harry, that's Hellfire. How do I yep. know that? Or whatever. You know, so he's starting to consciously use it. And and then he takes yeah he, that final step into actively kind of summoning her for help. So did you want to talk about your Leshiel thoughts? Or it sounds like maybe this is the worst of the best thing? Yeah, worst of the best. I mean, I, I can just talk about the worst of the best. To me, I thought this like was totally lifted off of the sixth sense which came out, I think, in 1998, um, where you have this person who, it was kind of reverse, right? Like, But it was like this twist where this person wasn't actually real and they were, you know, like if you look back, like they never touched anything, they never went anywhere in public, they never spoke to each other in public, which it was really cool when The Sixth Sense did it. It actually, it, I think The Others is, is, is another scary movie that did it similarly well. But to me, it was just like, I don't know. I was like, well, that was a cool twist but it had already been done a couple times before. So I wasn't a fan of that twist. What did, what did you think when you read it? I was fine with it. I, I guess I'm okay with plot threads being reused as long as it's like, I, if he had already had a book that was written where this happened again, you're like, okay, yeah, we've already got this. Thanks for the twist. 
we know it's coming. I, I didn't really necessarily see it coming, although I'm pretty bad at picking up things like this. Did you see it coming already? Well, no, I didn't, which was surprising. Granted, I listened to this like basically in one sitting, so I never really had time to ruminate on on the finer things. I did think it was cool that like, oh, it was the the werewolf dude. What's his name? Billy. Billy. Yeah, Billy was like, "Are you are you going crazy, Harry?" Like they kind of like started to question his sanity, and the whole time you're like, "Well, Harry always kind of is a little bit crazy," but it, you realize it was because anytime he was talking to Sheila, he was actually like talking to himself. And like, I think the guy in the bookstore heard him talking to himself in the back and kind of told Billy about it. So I thought that was funny where people like just thought that Harry was going crazy, which turns out he kind of was, you know, like this was all in his head, you know? So yeah, you kind of get into this fun thing where it's like, if are you like, would you know you're crazy if, if you were crazy? So that's your worst of the best then. You liked the twist, but you thought it had been overdone because you've seen it too many times in other, in other things. The reason it was worse of the best as well is because I like the fact that that Lashiel is kind of coming out and influencing things and p- posing these moral dilemmas to him and that he's like working it into his moral fiber and kind of um, incorporating that into himself and deciding to kind of go a little bit down the dark path. So there's a lot of cool things about it. I just didn't like that part of Lashiel. I was fine with it. But yeah, I mean, if you thought it was overused, I guess that is a fair criticism. I'm glad that your worst of the best was not the next thing we're going to talk about, because if you had an issue with Sue the T-Rex, I would have kicked you out of Dresden Files reviews forever, because this is the most awesome moment of the entire series. Here it is. Harry uses the necromancy he's gotten from last year to animate the freaking dinosaur Tyrannosaurus Rex, and he hops on the back and takes off down the streets of Chicago to stop the, uh, the, you know, the, the gathering here that's happening with the Kemlerites and the Earl King. And everything that's been building up. This climax was so awesome. Like I cannot get enough of this. This image of like a wizard riding a Tyrannosaurus Rex down the streets of Chicago. Stomping on someone's Corvette. You know, sorry about your Porsche, man. And as he like kills ghouls and, and fights fights Faye. I mean, how awesome was this? Yeah, and he also like jumps on like this army Hummer. And, and this is all funny too because Butters is the one that's playing polka to animate this or to be like the rhythm or the drummer or whatever. Right. So right. it's like, not only do you have the T-Rex, you have like this guy in the polka suit. That's kind of, that's making this all happen. And, and Harry screams something funny. I forget what he screams when he's writing it, but I mean, yeah, it's perfect. Is it like polka will never die? That was his fight. Well, that, that was butters. Yeah. Yeah. That was butters is saying, but I, I don't know. He screams something else. Like Harry always has these one liners when he's writing into battle. Right. Like I know in, I think, book three, it was I Don't Believe in Fairies. Yeah. And in the in the last book, um, there was one after he drops the turkey down. He's like, for my next trick, for my next trick anvils. I wish I knew what this one was, but I'm sure he had a good one line. We'll, fi- we'll find it and post it too. Yeah. Or, or, or just on Discord. Check it out. There. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so then everything just kind of happened here. There's a fight with the Wardens and Corpse Taker, Gervain, and Cowl all kind of have different moments. Eventually, I mean, we don't need to go blow by blow here, but eventually things are looking really bad and Harry's being held. And it looks like I think Cowell is about to like ascend, essentially, and and gather all of these uh, necromantic energies. But and, and he's also got Bob on hand. So he's stolen Bob and he's unlocked Bob's memory. And he's about to really like become the next Kemmler and destroy Chicago and probably the world. It's really bad. On top of that, Corpse Taker had switched places with the head warden. I forget her name. Oh, what is it? I feel like we should probably get this right. Yeah, this warden is important. Her name is uh, Lucio. Okay, Lucio? L-U-C-C-I-O. Yeah, so Lucio kills the Corpse Taker, but the Corpse Taker uses that opportunity to switch bodies with her, and Harry's the only one that kind of figures it out. And so he, he takes the opportunity to kill the corpse taker who's in the body of Lucio and Morgan sees and is just irate and he's about to kill Harry and Harry realizes that his best like the best way for him to save Chicago is actually by letting Morgan kill him to kind of leave the other wardens to fight and so he's just getting ready to let Morgan kill him and then one of the other wardens um, believes Harry he overhears Harry telling Morgan and so he actually saves Harry right there which was kind of crazy like crazy moment to see Harry like just about to let Morgan kill him. Yeah, this dude's name is Ramirez, right? Yeah. The other warden. 
Yeah, I think he becomes like the head warden in L.A. or something. And so him and Harry kind of are are taking care of America after the book ends. That's yeah, not a bad position. Yeah. And so you kind of do see like the beginnings of a friendship happen there between those two people. And meanwhile, Morgan has been kicked out of Chicago, I think. Like Harry's kind of the head warden there. And and Morgan. Harry's in charge of Chicago. Uh, Morgan is like head warden overall, though. Oh, really? Now that Lucio's gone? Right. She kind of steps down because she's in this different body that can't do magic, right? Oh, that's. I did not know that. I don't know if we're told that. No, you are. Yeah. So Harry kind of reaches an understanding with Morgan right at the end. Yeah. Before that happens, though, the final resolution to the climax is Bob is able to kind of break Cowell's control and he takes control of Sue. The dinosaurs, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. So if it wasn't good enough already, Bob animates the whole T Rex and and takes that is able to disrupt what's going on enough for Harry to get in and break it all up. And and luckily, um, all the energy kind of dissipates and there are no necromantic gods formed. Harry forms a truce with the Earl King, and then he goes back to Mavra, gives her the word of Kemler. He threatens her with everything he's got, which obviously this is going to be important going forward. And like you said, he reaches an understanding with Morgan and the Wardens. And then right at the end, you have a nice moment where his hand is kind of healing and he's playing the guitar with Butters. So that's a wrap for the book. Uh, Ben, what did you kind of think of these these final, I mean, I guess, what did you think of the end of the climax and the falling action? I guess a few thoughts. One, I'm kind of getting annoyed at how many potential threats there are going forward. So that aren't really like addressed at all. So for one, you have the Earl King and you're like, okay, this is like some like super OP dude that's going to be after Harry. He, he has an understanding, but that's only because like Harry impressed him or whatever. And he's like, but if we ever cross paths this again, I'm going to kill you. Well, he's pretty much got that with all the Fae in the Never Never. Yeah. But so then, and then we have He Walks Behind, which was introduced last book. And you're like, okay, that's obviously going to be something. You right. know, so there's like all these kind of big, bad people out there that, that are going to be after Harry. And that's kind of counteracted by the fact that like, Harry is learning these new magics that that he's kind of becoming stronger. So he's learning necromancy and he um, has the fallen angel on his side. And so he's kind of like becoming OP in his own right. So that's, you know, that's pretty cool that that's all happening. Wait, so you have an issue with this though? Because this sounds awesome to me. This is why I like the Dresden Files. It's kind of like a love-hate relationship. Like I feel like I want these things that are clearly being talked about to actually like impact more things. Like, I thought that he walks behind was going to play an important role in this book. But, like, Harry doesn't even, like, spend any time thinking about him. Like, it seems like somebody that tried to kill you when you were in your teenage years just came back to life. It would leave you a little bit more freaked out than just, like, going about life normally and just hoping that he doesn't, like, come out of the shadows to get you. Well, I, it's a narrative. So I think you're just kind of getting Harry telling you what's important for this story. Fair. That's fair. It sounds like what you're telling me is that you are impatient for more Dressed in Files and you would, like resolutions to these plots and and you want to see what's going on here so you're liking it quite a bit yeah oh yeah it's it sets things up well but i kind of feel like it's almost like the whole series is just one big setup for the next thing which i guess does kind of happen in these more like serialized dramas you know but it just seems like there's always like another problem that's being like it seems like harry always takes two steps forwards and one step back with these books you know i can see that so the big bads are being set up but they're never really defeated and the plot of this book with the Kemlerite people, I mean, sure, they're taken down, but we just add more enemies and the, the looming threats are still there. Yeah, exactly. And so do you, did you know that the final resolution to these books, which obviously have not come out yet, uh, Butcher is planning on writing like a three-part Armageddon trilogy to wrap things up. So I, I think that's where you'd expect to get resolutions with all these big ones. Yeah, that's true. It's weird because normally like these threats starts to coalesce into one big threat that you can see how they could take down everything at once. But that just kind of seems like Harry's going to have to like fight each of these guys individually and kill them individually. But I don't know. I mean, there's still what, like seven books until I get to the end. Yeah. So this is book seven. You've got eight more before you even are caught up. So uh, don't get too impatient. There are definitely some large uh, resolutions and changes, which is the title to one of the books where big changes happen. Yeah. So yeah, you're going to get resolutions. Don't worry too much. Uh, just keep on reading. That's all I can say. And then my last honorable mention goes to Butters, who I don't think we paid enough attention to throughout this review. Super likable character. This kind of guy who starts out as a kind of cowardly, really comes into his own and ends up like helping Harry out a ton. 
saves his life a few times. He kind of proves Thomas wrong. Thomas does not have a high opinion of him. And Harry kind of gives him this pep talk where he, he like makes him like recite Polka Never Dies. Like, and so now uh-huh. Butter just goes around screaming that whenever he gets scared. And he gets to ride on top of an animated T-Rex. I mean, yeah. how cool is that? That's like my dream. <laughs> yeah. So not only does he have, like Harry kind of has this cool little sidekick, but he also has the know-how to really understand the scientific reasons why lizards do what they do. And so I, I think that that was kind of a cool character to add and and get his time in the spotlight in this book. Let me give you my worst the best to kind of close things up. I think we've talked about everything. So was it confusing to you at all that the word of Kemmler just happened to be taped to the inside of a T-Rex skull in Chicago? Did that make sense? Okay, I don't know if that... I thought it was in the wall on the second story. No, no, no. I'm pretty sure that it was taped to the inside of the skull. Well, it wasn't there for a long time, right? Because the thug that worked for what's his name that that had found Marcone. it yeah so Marcone's thug had found it in like some storage shed or something and it tried to sell it and then he knew that people were after him and so he took the time to hide it so it's not like it was just chilling out there for for like years since then okay World sure War. so i guess Marcone's guy found it and um, that kind of set off some rumors going around through the magical community i guess that makes sense but that just seemed a little contrived to me to think that, you know, this dude just ran across this book and set across this whole chain of events to draw in everyone. Like, I, I really liked the plot and I liked almost everything about the book. But just one thing I would nitpick was this or- origin story, I guess, of yeah. the plot was maybe a little weak to me. It seems like it kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, well, it's funny because it's a weak point that's sandwiched in between strong points, right? Because like, Kemmler had a cool backstory like in World War One, and kind of like gaining acolytes and animating the dead. And so it had a strong history. I just don't feel like he was able to find a way to bridge that into the current day. And it, yeah, you're right. That part seems contrived to me. So I would I would agree with the worst of the best. I think that the that the origin story of Kemmler was strong, but the way that this book was brought into current day was not strong. Sweet. So overall, we really like this one. I think once we finish our Dresden reviews, we'll have to do power ranking of the Dresden books, but thus far through the seven that we've reviewed, this has been my favorite. Yeah. And in terms of character ranking rankings, Butters is like number two after Harry on my list right now. Butters really made a name for himself in this book for you. He did. One other little piece of Dresden news. Uh, not an hour ago, I opened my copy of the 20th anniversary Stormfront limited edition hardcover. This was going to be only available at comic cons throughout the country, but with COVID, all the cons were shut down. So this was just uh, available for sale. I don't know if it's still available or not, but it's a really beautiful uh, hardcover edition of Storm Stormfront. I'll have to post some uh, photos of that on our Discord channel. We have a channel just devoted to bibliophiles, which I'm slowly becoming. <laughs> yep. And we're also doing, I'm doing kind of a read along, although I'm not super active in that right now, but that's been, that's been fun too. Yeah. When are you going to get into book eight? I always try and wait till we record these podcasts so I don't get my books like messed up. So I don't like spoil anything for future books. So I think I'm going to start that like tomorrow. I'm going on a bike ride tomorrow. So I'll start that. Nice. I think, uh, what is, okay, is it Death Mask? It's the horror movie one. If you don't remember, uh, it's pr- Proven Guilty. Proven Guilty. Okay. Yeah, I think I it was available in the library. So what's nice is that as you go deeper and deeper into the series, the books start becoming more and more available. People just kind of, fall off slowly but surely and there's less wait times yeah that makes sense i mean genesis is the most read book in the bible right yeah <laughs> yeah it was a good good book and i'm looking forward to to getting to changes i feel like that's you guys have hyped that book up so it's really good man but uh thanks for reviewing deadbeat with me uh if you like what we're doing at phantology check us out at phantology books and at www.phantologybooks.com hop on discord tell us what we did wrong tell us what we can do better and maybe even consider supporting on Patreon. So thanks, Ben. See you next time. Cool. See ya.